cities in China are covered by smog. Uh, there are some historical areas, but very few, and the rest of, uh, of the urbanized area is not very exciting, in fact. Uh, but uh, we, we spent about five days there, and one evening our hosts from Wuhan, they invited us for a special occasion evening, and this was the visit to the street market. And you can see the last picture is the uh, food uh, shop uh, in the street market in Wuhan. And this was probably the place where the whole pandemic started in December 2019. If you you have you had the uh, op opportunity to follow uh, all the events at the onset of the epidemic, uh, but in fact we were surprised as doctors who are uh, reading the medical journals that very soon after the first uh, observations in China, the Chinese colleagues started to publish the new data on the new condition in the international medical journals. And the first one concerning the pediatric uh, population and COVID-19 was published on the March 16th in Pediatrics. Pediatrics is one of the two major American journals and is the second highest uh, high, uh, ranked uh, journal in pediatrics. And uh, it was not written by people from Wuhan. Uh, it was written by five professors from Beijing, in fact, and they only collected the data that were sent from Wuhan to the central database. So they write not, nothing uh, about individual patients. They, they are writing only about the epidemiological numbers. And in this article, uh, they have collected the pediatric patients diagnosed with COVID-19 between January 16 and February 8. Uh, and they have split the clinical presentation in the pediatric patients to five grades of severity. The first one is the asymptomatic infection. Uh, they find they have found children that they develop no clinical symptoms. The second group are mild patients who have symptoms of the upper respiratory tract infection, fever, fatigue, muscle pain, cough, sore throat, nasal secretion. Some patients have just gastrointestinal symptoms, not respiratory, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea. The third grade of severity is a moderate COVID-19 infection in children. Children with pneumonia, fever, cough, which is mostly dry initially and followed by productive cough. Some of these children can lack clinical symptoms, but they have a clear damage on the pulmonary CT scan, showing subclinical lung disease. The fourth severity grade is the severe infection with fever, cough, gastrointestinal symptoms in some children with progressive course. After one week, they develop dyspnea with central cyanosis, which is severe involvement of the lungs. They decline their oxygen saturation below 92%, and they develop clinical symptoms of hypoxia. These are children who undoubtedly require oxygen administration. And the fifth degree of the severity is the critical course with the progression of acute respiratory distress syndrome and respiratory failure, which can progress to shock, encephalopathy, myocardial damage, and or cardiac failure. These children develop coagulation defects and acute kidney injury, and the multi-organ failure can cause their death. So these are the five degrees of severity as described initially in China, in Wuhan. However, it's more or less still our clinical experience from pediatric patients with COVID-19. Uh, this is the table uh, derived from the data from the original article from March describing the patients from Wuhan. And uh, you can see uh, 
five lines according to the age of the patients. These are the infants, these are the preschool children, these are the children in the early school years, these are the children 11 to 15, and these are the adolescents. Uh, and these are the percentages of those who have developed the five different degrees of severity. First of all, the critical course was very rare and only three children developed the critical form of COVID-19 among the over 2,000 in China. Only one patient died. It was a 13-year-old boy. And unfortunately, the precise description of the uh, disease course and of the cause of his death is not displayed in the article. The severe forms are relatively rare, maybe more prevalent in infants. And then you can see prevailing mild and moderate courses of COVID-19 in children. And they have only single patients with the asymptomatic disease, but that's clearly because they did very uh, few investigations in, in those children who were in epidemiological risk and did not develop any symptoms. This is underestimated severely, and we now know that most of the children, in fact, who are infected and who are PCR positive, they have the asymptomatic disease. Excuse me? Yes, please. Um, in the chart that you just showed, the severe cases in the infant population um, is it known if those infants were preterm or term babies? It was not given in this article from China. These were truly just collected numbers from reports from the Wuhan hospitals. So they do not allow a closer uh, analysis. Uh, but uh, from the next reports, I will be then showing data from the US and from some European countries. And you will see that the prematurity is a risk factor for a more severe disease. So it will be maybe just on, yes, it is just on the next slide. So this is the collection of data coming from the US. You know that the US still have the highest numbers of the totally uh, affected people worldwide. And uh, by sure not for the population, but in the absolute numbers. And the incidence of COVID-19 in children was low in the US too. And again, most of the cases were mild or in this case asymptomatic because by sure in the US it worked and the uh, contacts, uh, the epidemiological contacts were screened. Uh, within the first two months of the epidemic in the US, only 1.7% of all positive patients were younger than 18 years. And the majority of them, in fact, were those over 10 years. And it was clearly shown that there is a lower probability of getting infected even after confirmed exposition. So the children look like that they have some kind of protection against being infected. And uh, in the US, they have founded the so-called so COVID net, which is a network of 14 states of the United States. And uh, they are reporting the patients together to one database. And within the uh, four months, March to July, uh, they, uh, they have uh, collected data over uh, 500 pediatric uh, inpatient cases from the hospitals. And this was eight cases per 100,000 population, which were, was much less than in adults, where it was 164 per 100,000 population. The mean duration of the hospital stay was very short, only 2.5 days. In one third of the cases from the hospitals, they were uh, treated in the intensive care uh, with median of two days and 6% of the children required artificial ventilation. And also in children, similar to adults, uh, they clearly defined the predisposing uh, comorbidities, which includes the obesity, but in fact the obesity is so prevalent in the United States that 
38% in the pediatric population is probably not much more than in the general population of children. Uh, but the chronic lung disease, especially asthma, is a clear uh, risk factor for developing a more severe course and the prematurity, as we mentioned already, but the prematurity was evaluated only in children below two years of age. In summary, uh, by May 1st, which was the first period of so-called first wave of COVID-19, there were 243 articles published on pediatric COVID-19. So, in fact, the year 2020 is very special in the medical literature because such an outbreak on articles on one single disease never occurred before. And in fact, some of them are of relative poor quality. So the peer-reviewed system at the very beginning was not very strict and people were only hungry and the journals were hungry for publishing data. Uh, but now it becomes more balanced and still the new information is coming day after day. Uh, the uh, first uh, three, 243 articles were uh, collectively uh, meta-analyzed and they uh, contain data on 7,480 children. And what is a very good news that the mortality in children is very low. Uh, there were only six children reported to die from COVID-19. And uh, the percentages of those affected by COVID-19 among the populations affected was 2% in China, below 2% in the US, 1% in the Netherlands, 2% in the UK. So these are consistent data showing the low prevalence in children. But questions remain. Uh, questions about vulnerable subgroups, question on the role of children in the community spread of infection, uh, the question on the vertical transmission, trans placental transmission, but in fact it was clearly never confirmed. Uh, we also had two newborns affected by COVID here, but it, it was clear the mothers were positive but the infection was transmitted postnatally uh, because the contact between the mother and the newborn is so close that the probability of uh, sharing the infection is extremely high. Uh, the question from the first wave was if the clinical differences in the severity of the COVID-19 in different age groups can help us to understand the viral transmission and also the immune response. And so we are now moving and to the clinical presentation of the pediatric COVID-19. In fact, those of you who are now in the third year and who are studying microbiology, they probably know much better than the clinicians. Uh, but also the clinicians within the past year have to learn much more about the viral physiology pathophysiology of the viral infections and also about the epidemiology. Uh, so we are now new experts, nearly everybody, uh, but by sure the, the background is not always very strong. Uh, but I will try to uh, share with you my current understanding of the life cycle of the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. And so this is the uh, basic uh, life cycle with the virus entering the organism of the, uh, of, of the human being, mostly by the uh, uh, respiratory tract. It can also enter through the gastrointestinal tract or through the, uh, through the eyes, through the conjunctiva, uh, through the mucosa. But the typical way is the epithelium of the respiratory tract. So, sorry. The first step, the uh, viral particle, which is this one, has to enter the cell of the uh, epithelium. And this can occur by two mechanisms. 
The one is the fusion of the membrane of the virus with the cell membrane. And then the content of the viral particle is entering the host cell. The second possibility is the endocytosis. So it means the cell membrane of the host cell is in fact catching the virus and introducing the virus into the cell and then cleaving the membrane and opening the content of the viral particle towards the cell content. Translation. So that's important. It is a RNA virus. So the RNA of the virus has to be translated by the uh, uh, endoplasmic reticulum of the uh, host cell. And after this translation, the proteins of the virus are starting to be produced by short because this is the way of the information coming from the virus and they are starting to be produced and then thereafter also somehow managed uh, and uh, they are working on this level of the replication transcription complex and there is the RNA dependent RNA polymerase working on this. And so this is the uh, production of the future components of the viral particle. And then it comes also to the RNA replication because all the new particles of the virus that will be produced by the host cell have to contain the RNA. And the all components are produced and then packed so the pack, uh, packaging is the next step and you can see the new viral particle produced by the host cell and then it is released to the environment and can attack the next cells where it can be re-replicated or it can be uh, used for the infection of the other uh, recipient. The two important and crucial steps for the infection are the first ones, in fact. And this is the interaction between the virus and the host cell. This is the process that's responsible for the infection or uh, the protection of the, uh, from the infection. And let's uh, see this process in more detail. So this is the viral particle. You can see the spikes here on the surface. Uh, everybody knows now how the virus looks like, uh, but in fact, this would, which looks like as being a tulip or other kind of a flower, uh, this is a trimeric protein. It's named the trimeric S protein. And this is the most important part of the virus for the infection, because the, pro the S protein is bound to the receptor on the surface of the cell. And it's well known from the previous coronavirus studies before the SARS-CoV-2 that the receptor of the cell is the angiotensin converting enzyme. And this is located on the surface of the cell and it's interacting with the trimeric S protein. But not directly and not so easily because before the uh, active binding, uh, effective binding also, it has to be primed. The S protein has to be partly cleaved and the protease that's cleaving the uh, S protein is the TMPR double S2. And this is the transmembrane serum protease type two. That's on the sur uh, surface of the cell and that's helping to prime the S protein. So both of these structures are essential for the uh, infection of the recipient. And both of them, the ACE2 and the TMPRSS2 are androgen dependent. And that's probably the crucial thing for the protection, partial protection of the children from the infection. Because these enzymes or the receptor and the enzyme 
are uh, less expressed in children before the first production of uh, steroid hormones, of, the, uh, of sexual hormones. And in fact, the first effective infect, uh, uh, production of the sexual hormones in children is the period of the adrenarche. Uh, I will uh, show you here on this cartoon, uh, the, this is the prenatal and pediatric part of the lifespan and displaying clearly the uh, sexual hormone production in the human body. During about mid gestation, the uh, gonads are ready to start to produce uh, the uh, sexual hormones, the androgens in male fetuses and the estrogens in female fetuses. And uh, it's dependent on the gonadotropins because the pituitary also is working and is sending the signals to the gonads. And the production of the sexual hormones is increasing within the second half of the gestation period. It's important because it helps for develop to the development or contributes to the development of the reproductive organs. For example, also is important for the testicular descensus. Uh, those who are missing the, the, the effective production of the androgens, if they are male fetuses, they are always born with undescended testicles. And then comes close to the uh, to the delivery. So this is the moment of the birth. On the side of the mother, there is the increased production of the estrogens. The estrogens are entering the fetal circulation through placenta and they are suppressing the gonadotropin production by the simple feedback, which leads to the decrease of the endogenous production. Soon after the birth, when the placental circulation is immediately interrupted and there is no more an influence from the maternal hormones, the, there is a reactivation. And the small children within the first months up to one year of life, they are producing their sexual hormones. It's now named as a mini puberty, which is a specific process that also contributes to the full maturation of the, uh, uh, of the reproductive system on the, by sure, on, on the uh, childhood level, not the full maturation in the sense of the pubertal maturation. Then the gonadotropins simply slow down with the production and the sexual hormones also slow down. And during most of the childhood, the gonads are asleep. They are not producing anything. And then they restart to produce the uh, sexual hormones again at the onset of the pubertal development. So this is the moment of the reactivation of the hypothalamus with the gonadotropin releasing hormone, uh, pituitary with the gonadotropins FSH and LH, and gonadal axis, gonads producing testosterone or estrogens. And then the uh, adolescents thereafter enter their adult life. And this is the adrenarche. The adrenarche is something very specific for the late childhood before the onset of the true puberty. So what ha what's happening with the, what's the adrenarche? It's something uh, linked to the adrenals, that's clear. And the uh, adrenarche means that the uh, adrenals start to do something. It's a moment of the full maturation of the zona reticularis. And those of you who still remember something from the histology uh, can remember that the adrenal cortex has three layers and the zona reticularis is that one that's maturing as the last one and it will be producing the uh, weak androgens. The weak androgens include, for example, the dehydroepiandrosterone sulfate. And they are important. Because at this moment of the adrenarche, the children start to uh, produce more sweat. They have active, uh, activation of, uh, of the sebaceous glands. They have a small mid-childhood growth spurt. Uh, they start to develop some pubic hair, uh, bo both boys and girls. And in fact, for the uh, girls, 
the uh, zona reticularis of the adrenals will be for the life long uh, necessity the site of the production of the androgens so it will be responsible for their pubic hair for example in males then within the true puberty the importance of the zona reticularis and of adrenarche is slowly disappearing on the background of the uh, very very high production of the testosterone in the gonads and so now we can see this is the onset of the production of some uh, adrenal androgens and this is the full production of the testicular androgens here and this is probably also the moment when the uh, risk of being infected by high amounts of coronavirus is increasing if the virus cannot sufficiently enter the host cell the effective infection dose is lower so that's an important statement that has been clearly shown and the next statement in covid 19 the effective infection dose is an independent predictor of mortality risk this has been clearly shown despite this is a very complicated mathematical formula uh, but they write down in this lancet respiratory medicine article that the mortality risk goes up by seven percent per each logarithmically transformed copy of the virus per milliliter please don't ask me about interpretation of this statement but it is a clear uh, proof that the more uh, viral particles are entering the cell, the more severe will be the clinical course of the infection. And the third observation, the adult men have significantly higher risk of the admission to intensive care unit and of death from COVID-19 if compared to females. This was a study from 10 European countries from the first wave from the spring and the risk ratio was uh, from these 10 countries uh, with the lowest increase in portugal 1.11 which means about 10 percent higher risk up to 1.54 in france which means over 50 percent increased risk of the icu admission and of death and there was no or there is no sex difference in children because in fact before adrenarche and even after adrenarche before the onset of puberty there is no difference in the sexual hormone production between um, males and females because the adrenarche is occurring in both sexes clearly well so it looks like that the pediatric patients or the, pedi the pediatric population is protected uh, but at the beginning, I told you that we are now experiencing a completely new condition. We are not the first one. It was uh, firstly reported from Italy. And you know that Italy was the first country to be truly affected uh, from at least uh, from the European countries, uh, when not counting China. And the Italian authors, uh, they have published in Lancet, it is this uh, reference, in June, on June 6, an outbreak of severe Kawasaki-like disease at the Italian epicenter of SARS-CoV-2 epidemic. And they have observed not many. It was about six cases. Uh, those of you who already entered the clinical training, they understand something about the Kawasaki disease. Kawasaki disease is a well-known condition in children but it is still uh, uh, genetically not clear. Uh, it's a vasculitis. It's something uh, linked to the vessels, uh, which uh, are, have, suffer from inflammation, uh, which is not infectious. It's uh, linked with the lymph adenopathy. It's linked with the long-lasting uh, fever, uh, one week in the Kawasaki disease is a criterion uh, and these children are developing some skin rashes and they have also palmar erythema 
or can have also the squamation of the skin on the uh, on the palms and uh, uh, they have one uh, important long-term sequelae and this is the uh, micro aneurysms of the coronary arteries uh, so kawasaki disease is well known uh, but kawasaki like disease is something that was completely new observation the italian authors did not go to details but then it was observed also in the united states and then it was observed in france and in the uk and at the beginning of may the doctors from the great ormond street hospital in london and the doctors from hospital de bray in paris they organized a video conference and it was something uh, for for me when i had the possibility to see it it was something uh, quite strange because they were simply putting together piece after piece of a new condition and never observed before only similar to the kawasaki disease and at that time you know that the number of cases in our country was so low uh, that the probability to developing something which is rare even among those affected was very low so we have not seen anything so at that time we were thinking yes and it's an interesting observation and now we are experiencing, due to the high numbers of patients, the same. And we are now gaining our own clinical observation. So what's known? Kawasaki-like disease was the Italian uh, denomination. Uh, the uh, British uh, published this under the name of Childhood Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome. No, sorry, these are the Americans. And the British you are using this term pediatric inflammatory multisystem syndrome, temporary associated with SARS-CoV-2. And uh, this, we are now using uh, this uh, acronym PIMS-TS for the British way of denominating this. But still the terminology is not fully established. This occurs not with the original infection, but two to four, maybe up to six weeks after the SARS-CoV-2 infection. It affects, according to the observations from the first wave in spring, about two uh, of 100,000 people aged below 21 years. And the clinical presentation, now I can tell you more, it's fever, of at least four days it's uh, a clear uh, conjunctivitis i will show you pictures of our patients then and other signs of vasculitis the children can have sudden abdominal pain up to sudden abdominal event some of them can have encephalopathy some of them who underwent the lumbar puncture had but not all of them uh, some uh, finding in the cerebrospinal fluid resembling the aseptic uh, encephalitis with increased protein and mildly increased cells in the cerebral spinal fluid. And uh, they can uh, develop uh, multisystem disease up to renal failure, but what's very prominent is the heart involvement. The heart involvement is also a present in the original Kawasaki disease, but in a different way. Uh, these children with the PIMS-TS mostly do not develop the uh, microaneurysms of the coronary vessels, but they develop uh, something wrong with the myocardium. Uh, some uh, uh, myocarditis, uh, let's say, but it is not non-infectious and only a very small part of them finally develop coronary aneurysms. And uh, how to detect? Compared to the Kawasaki, where there is absolutely no pathognomonic laboratory finding, the children with the PIMS-TS always have positive antibodies against coronavirus. Some of them still can have the PCR positivity, but uh, we expect that this is just the persistent positivity, which is known also from other cases. So that's also the reason why those who underwent the COVID-19 infection 
uh, are regarded as the uh, uh, risk-free for uh, transmitting infection following three days of the asymptomatic course after, uh, after passing the symptomatic period uh, because there can be persistent presence of some viral particles uh, which are PCR positive but they do not cause infectiosity. And then the laboratory findings in these unfortunate children include the increased troponin, increased CRP, increased ferritin, increased lactate dehydrogenase and positive D-dimers. Uh, most of these findings uh, show something wrong with the myocardium, with the inflammation, and also with the procoagulation status. They have increased neutrophils, but they, ha they are have anemia. They have decreased numbers of the lymphocytes. They can develop hypoalbuminemia, and they have procoagulation status, coagulation defects. Uh, and the treatment. Uh, it is an acute condition and unfortunately uh, one child, to our not very clear uh, knowledge and understanding, has died close to another hospital in Prague about two weeks ago uh, when this uh, outbreak of this condition appeared here. Because you may know that the peak of the infection in this country was the last week of October and first week of November. Now we are going down with the number of cases and it has clearly copied with the delay of two to four weeks the peak of the infectious period or of, of, the, of, of the epidemic. And uh, that was uh, unclear for me, an unclear case when the parents somehow uh, refused to the hospitalization of the child despite having the fever and the doctors in that time did not realize that there can be uh, some kind of this condition and allow them to go home and the child then probably died at home but I don't know exactly uh, uh, so the mortality rate in principle is quite low it's about two percent but I'm just saying this unfortunate case because the children truly they require intensive care. Most of them uh, have been hospitalized, and these are the reports from the spring, uh, at the intensive care units. They have to start immediately with the immunomodulation uh, because they, they have to uh, receive intravenous immunoglobulins. They have to receive in parallel with the intravenous immunoglobulins, the uh, methylprednisolone infusions in high dosage. And some of them then require additional immunomodulation. And probably or mostly the first additional step is the anakinra. And those who already studied immunology or pharmacology, they know that the anakinra is the selective inhibitor of the interleukin-1. Uh, there are additional drugs still uh, can be used if the process is persisting and the inhibitors of the other interleukins can be used as the inhibitors of the interleukin-6 or of the tumor necrosis factor. Some of these children, and this is our experience, require the uh, inotropic support of their heart action uh, because they are at risk of the circulatory failure which then can result into the kidney failure because of the insufficient uh, blood supply to the uh, kidneys. Uh, about 20% of them require artificial ventilation and the extracorporeal uh, membranes oxygenation, just single patients, we have not seen this. Uh, it is, uh, this was a question mark before, but by sure it is an aberrant cellular and humoral immune response. I will show you how probably it works, but we do not know by sure everything. But now I will show you uh, some pictures of our patients. So this is the conjunctivitis. You can see it is not the normal conjunctivitis that we know from the everyday life. It is something uh, resembling the vasculitis, and yesterday, one of our patients, because 
we, we have now had uh, seven patients within the past 10 days and uh, they are developing, they are today, they are teaching us uh, something new about this disease. Yesterday, one of the new patients developed uh, hemorrhage, uh, which uh, affected the eyelids. Uh, probably if the vasculitis is affecting the wall of the capillaries or of the vessels more, it can lead to the hemorrhages. You can see here is the tongue and here are the uh, lips that are also partly affected. And then these are the different levels or different forms of the skin rashes that are appearing in these children. So uh, this uh, cartoon shows the uh, recent uh, knowledge from the clinical or observations from the clinical presentation. And now let's go back to the uh, pathophysiology before we uh, end up, in fact. So uh, three levels uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the function of the immune system. So this is the healthy individual. This is the epithelium of the uh, respiratory tract, which is normal, intact. And this is the vessel, this is the bloodstream with the uh, CD4, CD8 cells and no symptoms. This is the, I see, uh -huh, I have, I better remove it like this because it was the animation that does not work here. And this is the mild course of COVID-19. So they are the coronavirus particles that are affecting the host cells, entering the host cells, are reproducing themselves, and they lead to the activation of the immune system. The macrophages and monocytes start to produce the cytokines, the tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, interleukin-10, and some others. Uh, interestingly, the uh, numbers of the lymphocytes are going down in the bloodstream and the CD4 lymphocytes start to express the interferon gamma. This is the situation of the uh, immune system and of the uh, blood count or the circulation in those who have fever, cough, fatigue, myalgia. So the mild to moderate course of uh, COVID-19. If we would measure, if we would measure increased interleukin-6 by sure, that's possible, and always decreased lymphocytes, decreased CD4 and CD8. And now let's come to the severe COVID-19, which is known from the adults, uh, but which is probably something which we can see in the PIMS TS children. So big uh, amount of uh, viral particles entering the body. So it means probably increased viral load. And then what's this? This is the accelerated uh, production of the cytokines. So the uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin 10, interleukin 6, produced in high amounts. And this is what the immunologists uh, like to uh, name as the cytokine storm or the syndrome of the cytokine release, the acute syndrome of the cytokine release. You can see these cells are disappearing. And the uh, clinical presentation includes not only uh, the flu-like symptoms as fever, cough, fatigue, myalgia, dyspnea, but the additional and unfortunately very severe symptoms of the septic shock, uh, uh, ARDS, uh, multi-organ failure, vasculitis, hypercoagulation status, spleen and node, the lymph node atrophy, disseminated intravascular coagulation, thrombosis, thrombocytopenia resulting from the dick and from thrombosis, limb gangrenes, and can add by death. This is the situation that was described in adults, in fact. This is not that what we now can interpret as being the background of the PIMS TS in children, but there are some similarities. What we do not know exactly understand is the different course in adults and in children. Because in adults, if they are infected, they mostly pass through the first week or first five days with uh, the flu-like symptoms, if they have symptomatic, uh, symptomatic form of the disease. And those who are entering the more severe, they start to be oxygen dependent at day five to seven. 
and then the unfortunate who will progress to the more severe disease, they progress immediately thereafter. So it means the second week of the disease is the most critical. And uh, they require then the intensive care and the intensive care can be successful, in fact, in most cases, but it can be very difficult. And on the other hand, in children, we have this disease-free interval. So they, 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 they are infected. They have mostly a mild course. In some of them, we only can observe the epidemiological risk. So for example, the parents were infected. They had their flu-like symptoms of COVID. And some of these children were never investigated, in fact, for COVID. And, but there is a clear epidemiological connection. And then following two to four, maybe up to six weeks, they start to develop this PIMS DS. And we do not exactly understand why. Okay, so uh, this is the new observation. And, but to, uh, to prevent the panic among the general population, uh, please, it's still rare. It's the same as in the other countries. We have got seven children within 10 days, so it looks like that it's quite frequent. But ju try just to imagine how many children were infected two to four, up to six weeks ago. You can remember they were up to 15,000 cases in the Czech Republic per day in that time. Some of them were children. We do not know exactly how many, and we do not know exactly how many of them were in fact diagnosed with the PCR and how many were not uh, uh, undergoing the PCR test. Uh, so these numbers are low, uh, but each of these patients is a patient requiring the full attention. Uh, last slide. So uh, I, I was just uh, entering one of the historical areas in Wuhan and there was this uh, souvenir cellar in front of this uh, uh, historical area. I, I was uh, just showing what some of the souvenirs uh, to the camera, but I'm sorry, I have forgot, forgotten them today, so I do not have them. Uh, but in fact, for all of us, the uh, probably a major souvenir from Wuhan for our lives would be the coronavirus cough, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so uh, it's a, a special year truly for every uh, medical professional, also for the general population, because it, it has changed the lives so much, uh, but uh, it, for, it is also a challenge for the medical profession, because never before uh, the uh, people were able to produce a vaccination uh, within 10 months. Uh, never were ready to produce the uh, targeted monoclonal antibodies that are now ready for use within this short period of time. So it's uh, also a great positive experience what the, in fact, the human civilization can do when everybody uh, acts within the uh, same direction. And my special thanks to Professor Xiaoping Lu, who was the one who invited us to Wuhan in 2013. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Level. Uh, thank you for this great- We, we do not have any spe special uh, channels for information about the vaccines. It's published in the media. It's uh, truly ready to registration. Uh, the uh, very rapid uh, clinical testing has been provided, but it looks like to be truly uh, reliable, safe and effective. So, in fact, everybody is now expecting that, you know, uh, from the media, from the news, that in early uh, next year, probably the vaccination uh, compound will be ready for use, in fact, all over the world. And there are several uh, pharma companies who are producing now, and it looks like that most of them will be uh, of similar effectivity, despite they have a slightly different uh, way of action. For example, the RNA vaccine, it's something new. It is a new concept. That is that one that was produced by Pfizer, if I'm correct, yeah, maybe. Yes, this is the RNA. Uh, but uh, I am I'm not uh, truly, uh, I do not feel to be an expert in the, in, in the vaccines yet. Yeah. I'm only the observer.
All right, thank you. And we have a question from the chat. Uh, what's the most likely way COVID is spread in children by parents or from school? Uh, we, in fact, we are missing also the, the real epidemiological data. Uh, but it looks like that it, for what we, we can see here among the children, they have acquired the infection from the parents in the families. Uh, so uh, the uh, way of uh, preventing the children to stay together at school is probably not the best way how to protect them uh, with the uh, regard on the damage that's caused by, uh, by the uh, missing school education. Yeah? Because it was three months in spring, maybe four months in spring. Now again, it was one or two months. Uh, so let us not uh, be afraid of uh, allowing children to attend the schools. Um, I also wanted to ask yes, please. Um, about the loss of sense um, after the acquired COVID, because as far as I know, after uh, most of the patients are losing the sense of smell and like uh, people in my family who are affected um, had this situation and I wanted to ask how it is like directly affecting the function and is it possible to gain the function back basically? Uh, yes, in fact, it is uh, quite a specific uh, symptom, uh, which is probably linked to the central nervous system, yes, because there is no other way how to explain. And the olfactory bulbs are, in fact, part of the central nervous system. So it means the coronavirus is affecting the central nervous system. And the, we have only, we have no ex experience in children. In fact, we had never a child because we have few children who have the COVID disease. We are, we are discussing the PIMS TS, which is a late uh, sequelae of COVID infection. Uh, but the active COVID patients with pneumonia, for example, they are very few. Uh, what, what was also part of my talk. Uh, but the sense of uh, uh, smell is known, the, the loss of smell is known from the adults. Also, uh, some of our colleagues who have passed through the infection, our doctors at the department, they had this kind of experience. They are reporting that it's, uh, it's coming back following uh, several weeks. Uh, what's your experience? Mm, actually, like those who are sick in my family, it's been like probably four or five months now and they still can't get it back. So I was just... They, they, you know, they are not getting it back, yes. Yeah. So I only heard, but it is also from the media, it is not a medical report, that they, they, they somebody started to produce some training kits for uh, regaining the, the smell, the sense of smell, uh, with, with some standard uh, concentrations. Uh, but I'm not sure if it can be helpful uh, because it's very difficult to uh, retrain uh, to, to sense the smell if the, if the cells simply do not work. Yeah. So uh, the long-term sequelae of, of COVID-19 are discussed. Uh, nobody knows exactly because the observation period is quite short. And in fact, we also do not know the long-term sequelae of the PIMS TS, which would be very important for us now, uh, because the heart uh, function looks like to come back, uh, but uh, nobody knows if it will be a total comeback, total restoration of the uh, uh, function of the myocardium, and if they will not experience any kind of the, the long-term risks. So, Nobody knows, probably. Thank you. Um, I have a question as well. Thank you for your talk, first of all. Um, my question would be regarding the immunomodulation, as some studies have found out that vitamin D decreases the risk of um, developing a severe disease course. So would you say that in children it would be appropriate to supplement vitamin D? It is an easy concept to supplement vitamin D, but it is not evidence-based, in fact, that it works. It was only a random observation. And in fact, vitamin D is uh, such a uh, miracle in many areas of uh, medicine. And in fact, if they then started uh, truly randomized trials with vitamin D, it never worked. 
So I am quite skeptical and I'm afraid there is not an easy way how to cope with the infection by medications that are available uh, on the general level. Uh, we have got, you know, the Remdesivir, which is an antiviral drug. It is a small molecule uh, that's probably working, but again, the, the reports are controversial, uh, but it is administered in adults. We gave it to one uh, child. It was a 15-year-old boy who developed the COVID pneumonia, so it means the early phase uh, disease. And uh, uh, then there are the uh, antibodies. Uh, you know, the uh, reconvalescent plasma uh, is used uh, because the people who pass through the disease are developing antibodies. All of them, in some of them, it can be detected, in some of them not, but all of them have them. In fact, that's clear. And so they can uh, offer the um, plasma for treatment of those who are severely affected. It partly helps, yes, because it is a way how to truly affect the uh, virus directly. And then there are the new drugs developed uh, on, the base, uh, uh, on the basis of the antibodies against the virus. And some of them are at the late phase of the uh, clinical trials and of the registration. Uh, so it will be monoclonal antibodies against the viral particle. Uh, especially against the S protein, which means the most uh, vulnerable part of the virus. Uh, uh, but it is the question is, can it help uh, against the early phase of the infection, prevent from the infection, or can it help also in the late phase of the infection? And this is probably not so much the case, because the late phase is independent then on the original infection, if it already started. But the so-called biological treatment, so it means the administration of the antibodies, which is derived from the reconvalescent plasma, uh, the intravenous immunoglobulins can help also in this sense partly, and the targeted monoclonal antibodies can be a way of uh, the medical treatment of, uh, of COVID. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. We have I have a question uh, in the chat. I'm sorry. They asked a while ago. We have two people in the chat that asked a while ago. Uh, first question is: uh, What about the post-infectious immunity, and how long do the children remain contagious after the symptoms resolve? Uh, so the uh, post-infectious immunity is uh, the observation period is now over half a year uh, from the first cases. So it is expected that the first half a year, the affected people who pass through the condition are uh, immunized. How long it will last, nobody knows. Uh, this can be also then the question of a link with the vaccination by sure, because with the vaccinations, you also cannot say so much before how long the, uh, the protection will last. So uh, this is about the uh, post-infectious immunity. What was the second question, please? And then uh, how long do the children remain contagious after symptoms resolve? If the, the, this is the general, uh, general observation, three days after the last, uh, last the three days symptom free should be enough for uh, losing the contagiosity. So uh, this is used for uh, the purpose of the isolation. Uh, so we had it also here in our team, those doctors who uh, were positive and who passed through the disease, COVID-19, they were allowed to come back uh, three days after the, uh, resolving the symptoms, at least 10 days after the first positive finding. Yeah, so I was wondering if, um, can I ask a question or? Yeah, yes, I'll, I'll say that yes. you can ask the question. Okay, so uh, my question is regarding the life cycle of the virus. Uh, thank you for your talk, by the way. So you said that the virus has to bind to the ACE2 receptor. And yes. I was wondering if that will um, influence the function of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Since no, no, it, no, 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 these receptors are abundant on the surface of these cells. 
so it does not compromise the function of the uh, normal renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Uh, but it was a, one potential uh, therapeutic target also, uh, in, which was tested, but it does not work uh, to somehow interfere with the normal function of the angiotensin uh, uh, of the ACE2 uh, receptor. But this uh, for treatment, it also did not help. Uh, so it's interesting that in our body, there are molecules that have some function, but uh, as we can see on this example, in some situations, the molecules can act as something completely different. In this uh, case, as a receptor for a virus. Okay, thank you. So in this case, an ACE inhibitor would not uh, work to uh, prevent, because since ACE2 receptor, decreases the uh, activity of angiotensin and ACE inhibitor, would that maybe have something to do with uh, helping to prevent the pathogenesis of the disease? That was my... Yeah, it, I'm sure it was uh, your idea. It was the idea of some uh, others before. It was tested and it did not work. Okay, thank you. We also have one more question from the chat. Uh, will the vaccine for COVID be added to the common vaccination list? And do you think as future, future physicians, we will see COVID as a similar disease as the flu? Uh, the first question, uh, at this moment, it will not be added to the general vaccination list, which is mostly for children, in fact, uh, because now they are, they are, the governments are in each country are developing concepts how to proceed with the vaccination. Uh, it should be a voluntary vaccination. Uh, first uh, of all, the those who are at high risk should be uh, vaccinated, uh, which are the elderly people and which are also the medical professionals. And then it should proceed to the general population. But it will be on the voluntary basis. So you, you might understand that now uh, there is a fear that there will be many refusers again, as in uh, vaccinations in general. And it can then uh, compromise the uh, effect of the vaccination because uh, we know that more or less 80% of vaccinated is a good protection of the whole population. But if it would be substantially less, then it will not help so much. And then was the question if in the future it will be included uh, somehow into the routine vaccination. Probably it depends on the uh, behavior of the virus. Uh, maybe the virus can disappear simply, uh, after uh, it will lose the possibility to spread over the populations. And if it will persist, then probably the vaccination can be in, uh, extended with the vaccination against the coronavirus. And uh, then there was the last part of the question, which was, uh, now I cannot remember. It was interesting. Uh, please, can you repeat the last part of the question? Yeah. Uh Will we see the COVID as just another yeah, as the general like disease? COVID. Yes. In fact, this is the concept from the doctors from the Department of Infectious Diseases. For example, Dr. Rohachova, who is the maybe the most known, well known. She is frequently uh, being interviewed, and uh, she's always saying we have to learn to live with the COVID-19 as an other infections. Yes, that's partly true, and maybe for the future it will be the case. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, now it is not just one of the many infections. Uh, because uh, in all countries, with the mm, uh, strong wave, uh, and these are many, uh, in fact, it has substantially increased the mortality rate. And it, much higher than even the worst attacks of the flu. Uh, so. It is much more infectious. Uh, the mortality is not so high, but still it is much higher uh, than in any other common infectious disease of the current days. Uh, so it, the question of uh, shall we live with COVID-19 just with the, as we do with the, uh, I don't know, uh, rotavirus or as we do with the uh, respiratory syncytious virus and as we do with the rhinovirus. Uh, I'm not sure about this. I think the mankind requires some uh, more uh, active strategy. 
And if you still have time, we have a few, two more, three more questions. Uh, one second. Are there similar, one second, I'm just, have there been any reports of skin rashes, vasculitis similar to PIMSTS in adults post COVID-19? I have not heard about them. Uh, the reports about the PIMS TS uh, that we received from uh, from the other countries, uh, they are talking always about people up to 21 years. So the very young adults, yes, uh, but not in the general adult population. Uh, again, one of the mysteries of, of the uh, of the uh, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And these mysteries, maybe if we understand them more, then they can help much to understand the pathogenesis. And we can maybe have another window into the function of the immune system in general. So COVID-19 has learned us uh, much more than just about a single disease. All right, then one last question. One last question. Uh, about the post-infectious immunity, is there a difference in strength of the immunity of the affected based on how severe the disease was? For example, an asymptomatic patient, will an asymptomatic patient have a weaker immunity than someone with symptoms? Oh, again, good question. All questions were good. Thank you for all of them. Uh, but in fact, probably nobody knows exactly. All right. All right. Thank you again for taking.